Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha channel. I am Swati Solanki, Assistant Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. I am taking up the course on white collar crimes and in today's session, I am going to discuss the Food Safety and Standards Act 2006, its features, definitions and organizational structure. The objectives of today's session would be as follows. To understand the features and the objectives of the FSS Act 2006, to understand the relevant definitions and penalties, overview of the organizational structure of the authorities under the FSS Act. Now before we get to the preamble of the Food Safety and Standards Act, it is important for us to know and recognize the international food st standards body called as Codex Elementarius Commission. Now, this body has been established by the joint collaboration between the Food Agricultural Organization and World Health Organization. India, in order to fulfill its international obligation, because India has become the member of Codex Elementarius Commission in the year 1964, the initiatives have been taken from that point onwards to make changes in the then existing legal framework pertaining to in the matters relating to the food. Now, in one of the first sessions, we had discussed that food adulteration and misbranding is one of the crimes which can be labeled as the white collar crimes. As earlier discussed, the white collar crimes are non-violent crimes which have been motivated with the uh, financial motivations in order to make more and more profits. Now, when we talk about adulteration and misbranding, the food business operators, in order to enrich themselves unjustly or by making the violations of the law, we can say that the matters pertaining to the adulteration in the food that we consume is very, very important. In order to understand that how these food business operators uh, do adulteration, rendering the food unsafe for consumption, or they, by practicing fraud or deception, mislead the consuming public, in order to appreciate this aspect, we must understand or have an understanding of how the food legislation in Indian context operates. Now we can see that this act is relatively new and it has integrated the earlier existing laws pertaining to all the rules and regulations in regard to the food items that we consume. Now, before we start the Act, it is important to refer to the preamble of the FSS Act 2006. It is an act to consolidate the laws relating to food and to establish the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India for laying down science-based standards for articles of foods and to regulate their manufacture, storage, distribution, sale and import to ensure availability of safe and wholesome food for human consumption and for matters connected therewith and incidental thereto. Now what is important if we look at the first aspect, it is an act to consolidate the laws. Now this phrase indicates that there were maybe other laws which dealt with the food that we consume, but those laws were scattered, right? So in order to bring all those laws under one umbrella, one single code has been constituted, which is the FSS Act of 2006. Now, what has been consolidated? How do we find that? So, when we refer to the second schedule appended to the Act, we will find that various legislations enlisted from point number 1 to 8 
have been provided in here and one of such legislation the principal legislation which addressed the problem of adulteration was the prevention of food adulteration act 1954 there were other regulations for different food items starting as the food products order 1955 the meat food products order 1973 the vegetable oil products control order 1947 the edible oil packaging regulation order 1998 the solvent extracted oil de oiled meat or edible flour control order 1967 the milk and the milk products order 1992 any other order issued under the essential commodities act 1955 relating to the food now when we look at the second aspect of uh, this preamble it says that there has to be one central body that makes sure that there are scientific based standards for ensuring that the food we consume is nutritious and it is safe for human consumption now what is this central agency it is been mentioned in here that is the food safety standards authority of india shortly it is called as fsi now it lays down scientific based standards now how these standards are been laid down and what are the measures for that we are going to discuss during the course of today's session now it regulates various aspects from the point when the food is been harvested after that stage when it is no longer in the hands of the farmer from that stage to the time it comes to your table everything has been regulated under this act so we say from farm to fork everything has been regulated by the fsi act so what are the five things that have been mentioned in here to regulate the manufacture second storage third distribution fourth sale and fifth is import now before we get to the definition part it is very important that when all the laws have been brought under one single umbrella what are the objectives of this act why we have done so so let's imagine if we were to refer to what are the regulation to make sure that the milk we are consuming is within the prescribed standards so we will refer to the milk order that is the relevant order let's say if we were to refer to the meat that we were consuming then in this case we had to refer to the other order now let's say i am someone who wants to sell manufactured food items so where do i go for procuring the license for manufacturing the food items so what i am focusing here on is that the person would require to run from pillar to pillar to get the things done but after having one single code or one single act we have made a shift from multi level or multi departmental control to the integ to the integrated line of command now when we talk about that the earlier principal legislation that was the prevention of food adulteration act 1954 the focus in that act was more on penalizing but it was not actually talking about that what are the standards that are required to be met by those who deal with the food sector or food industry so what we see that there is a paradigm shift which has been made under the fsi where the shift is from the regulatory regime to the self compliance through food safety management systems after having discussed this we see then responsibility on food business operators to ensure that food processed manufactured imported or distributed is in compliance with the domestic food laws so what we are looking here let's say i want to start my catering business for that i need to first have the license in place meaning that whatever utensils i'm going to use for preparing the food item they are of the required prescribed quality they are not eroded there is no chance of contamination in the food so what this act does that it prescribes for different standards from food to the utensils in which you are preparing the food 
where you are storing the food, how you are transporting the food. Everything has been taken care of under this act. Then it says the compliance. Now, where they need to comply? They need to comply with the regulations which have been notified by the FSI under the FSS Act. One such notification is going to be discussed in some time. Then provisions for graded penalties depending on the gravity of the offence and accordingly civil penalties for minor offences and punishment for serious violations. Now imagine that I have not renewed my licence. Have I not followed the law that is expected to be followed so I have not complied with the law for that I may be imposed with fine but let's say I have been manufacturing some food which has caused some injury to an individual and for that in that injury the person was admitted in the hospital for that the graded higher punishment has been prescribed let's say the death has been caused that what is the amount of compensation that may be prescribed for that it may it shall not be less than 10 lakhs. So we will see such examples where graded penalties have been provided. Now before we go to the definition clause which is section 3, it is first important for us to understand that how the food has been defined and what are the different aspects that we need to take into consideration when we are looking at the food item. So the food as a concept which is very inclusive and wide has been provided under section 3 clause J. Further speaking, this food would this food would also include primary food which has been provided under section 3 clause ZK. Now sometimes we do see that there are foods for which no standards have been laid down by the FSI. And those foods are being then categorized as proprietary food, but this is not the part of the definition. However, it is being provided under section 22, subsection 4. All of us have come across Nestle Maggi controversy. So it was interesting to note that we did have the standards for pasta, but we did not have the standards for noodle cake. So noodle cake for which there were no standards, would fall under the category of proprietary food and proprietary food are being defined under section 22 clause 4. Now when we are referring to the food items, there are chances that this food item that we are consuming has been adulterated with other substance that is not meant for consumption. So what do we say that the food is mixed with some sort of adult trend. So where the adult trend has been defined, it is defined under section 3 clause A. Sometimes we also see that food has been contaminated uh, during the stage of let's say we are processing the raw material or it has come from the environment and then we say that the quality of the food item is then compromised with. So what are the different kinds of contaminants that have been provided that what is to be included when we talk about contaminants? This has been provided under section 3 clause G. So contaminants can be of different types, physical contaminants, biological contaminants, chemical contaminants, right? So taking uh, the discussion further then we have something called extraneous matter right we will see what is the meaning of it under section 3 clause i and food additive which has been provided under section 3 clause k so what do we need to refer to section 3j section 3zk section 3a, section 3g, section 3i and section 3k. So let's get into the definition aspect. Food means, now it tells us that what do we actually mean when we are referring to the food. It is a misnomer that FASAI only deals with the processed food but it will be clear to you when you refer to the operating part of this definition that it include processed partially processed or unprocessed food. So whatever you are consuming, 
as a food item would fall under the definition of the food. But we must proceed with caution here because some items have been excluded from the definition of food. So let's first read this. Food means any substance whether processed, partially processed or unprocessed which is intended for human consumption and includes primary food to the extent defined in clause ZK. So let's get to clause ZK first. Primary food means an article of food being a produce of agriculture or horticulture or animal husbandry and daring or aquaculture in its natural form resulting from growing, raising, cultivation, picking, harvesting, collection or catching in the hands of a person other than a farmer or a fisherman. So essentially it is including all the food items that are intended for human consumption be it derived from agriculture, horticulture, horticulture means that we are referring to edible flowers, animal husbandry, daring or aquaculture. But what is the important aspect in here is that, that as long as these items are in the hands of that person who is growing them or who is harvesting them, Till that point, FASAI will not be applicable. So the minute the produce is ready and it has been harvested and it is sent for the sale in the market, be it a wholesale market or the retailer market, from that point onwards, from the point of distribution, storage, warehousing, sale, import, FASAI would be applicable. Now, when we are talking about the definition of food, let's once again get back to it. It would also include genetically modified or engineered food or food containing such ingredients as infant food, packaged drinking water, alcoholic drink, chewing gum and any substance including water used into the food during its manufacture, preparation or treatment. So what are the things that have been included in here? That even when we are referring to the packaged drinking water, we go to some hill station, we see that a bottle which looks like as if we are consuming bisleri water, but when we look carefully, it is not bisleri, it is bilseri. So whether the fasai would attract in here, the answer is yes. The manufacturer of this bilseri water bottle is trying to mislead the customer wherein it resembles the other brand. So what has been done here that uh, representation has been made wherein he is trying to deceive the customers. When we see further it also includes alcoholic drink and when we refer to the preamble of the act it also says that FASAI would also be applicable on the import. Now, one interesting case had come to my knowledge that when this legislation was very, very new and it, it's still in its nascent stage, but when it had came to in its operation, when we were still training our officers, the officer had stopped the consignment of wine bottle because according to them, no expiry date was written on those consignment. And we all know that wine gets better with age and it does not come with any sort of expiry date. So the question here is that whether we have trained our officers right in order to fully understand that how this law is to be applied. Now we have come very far from that stage wherein we see that lot of progress, lot of work has been done by the FASAI in educating not only the officer but making the general awareness among the public like you and I. Chewing gum and any substance including water used in the food during its manufacture, preparation or treatment. Now when we talk about the small vendors, they do not really care about the hygiene, especially when it comes to use of the water. 
but we do know that water may have some heavy metals in that and ultimately we consume that prepared food item so if we talk about that whether these small vendors are also be regulated by the fsi the answer is yes because the definition says that water used in the food during its manufacture preparation or treatment will also be a component which can be defined as a food item now comes the part which says that what are the things that need to be excluded from the definition of the food and these are but does not include any animal feed live animals unless they are prepared or processed for placing on the market for human consumption now let's discuss this aspect live animals unless they are prepared or processed for placing on the market for human consumptions we have seen many a times in the poultry farm where the chicken are being raised for uh, selling them into the market for human consumption in order to increase the supply right they are being injected with the hormones and these are carcinogenic in its nature so what is happening here that when they are been injected with these hormonal growth injections we are also developing some resistance against them sometimes so that these uh, animals do not contract disease and the produce can be kept intact they are also been injected with antibiotics and that is one of the reasons that we all of us are developing resistance against the antibiotics if we are meat eaters especially in the case of chicken so until and unless we say that this animal is freely moving not intended for human consumption this act will not be applicable but the minute we say that it has been prepared to be sent to the market for the sale for human consumption automatically the fsi would come into its picture so when we talk about injections are being used in the poultry farm whether we have any regulation which specifies that this should be the limit of the veterinary drug which is traced in the body of this animal the answer to that question is yes so what is happening in here whatever is been injected internally the residues of it are going to be found in the body of this animal now then it further excludes plant prior to harvesting so as long as the crops are standing in the farm fsi will not come into the picture drugs and medicinal products cosmetics narcotic or psychotropic substances when we talk about drugs and medicinal products the drugs and cosmetics act of 1940 would be attracted which basically deals with how the products are to be circulated in the market and what price when we talk about narcotic or psychotropic substances they are to be regulated by the narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances act this is the reason we have excluded from the definition of the food under the food safety and standards act of 2006 now there may be a situation where central government may notify that we from now onwards are going to consider this particular item as a food item so for that one proviso is attached to the definition which is provided that the central government may declare by notification in the official gazette any other article as food for the purposes of this act having regards to its use nature substance or quality so the power lies with the central government that they may notify any other food item under the definition of the food clause j now when we are referring to the food and we are saying that uh, the attempt is to have a food item which is safe for human consumption so we are referring to the food safety of the food items and it is been defined under clause q food safety means assurance that food is acceptable for human consumption according to its intended use so that we can say the quality is not been compromised now there are people who deals with manufacturing storage sale distribution and import of food item as reflected in the preamble of the act so any person who is dealing with either of the five 
he will be called as the food business operator now let's have a look at section 3 clause o first food business operator in relation to the food business means a person by whom the business is carried on owned and is responsible for ensuring the compliance of this act rules and regulations made there under so the food business operator must have all the regulations followed must have the license to run his business now clause n says food business means any undertaking whether for profit or not this aspect is important and whether public or private carrying out any of the activities relating to any stage of manufacture processing packaging storage transportation distribution of food import and include food services catering services and sale of food or food ingredients so sometimes we see that people have suffered food poisoning because they consumed lunch at some temple or charitable institution students studying in a school fell sick because they consumed food which was injurious to health now whether this there is any accountability on these food business operators who are running these undertaking whether it is been undertaken for profit or not so when we use this example food being served let's say in school mid day meals food being served in charity charitable institutions or temple they are not been run for making any profit but nonetheless the provisions of food safety and standards act would be applicable it then says catering services or sale of food or food ingredients so it is just not the prepared food but we are also talking about the ingredients that are being used in preparing that food catering services is also important the food that you consume at the wedding the food that you consume at some event if the caterer has supplied the food item which caused some injury to you he will be held accountable under the provisions of this act now when we are discussing all of this one must understand that why we are discussing uh, the provisions relating to food safety this person who is manufacturing or in any way compromising with the food quality there is a duty that is expected from him that he must comply with the standards if he is not doing so the only motive that can be traced is that that by misleading his customers by misleading the consumers right by catering un safe food or misbranded food or sub standardized quality food the intent is to make the profit the minute you see this intent of making the profit it automatically falls under the bracket of non violent crimes because the injury is nonetheless been caused now when we come to the first part Uh, which can be found in the food item is the adulterant the definition is read as adulterant means any material which is or could be employed by making the food unsafe substandard or misbranded or containing extraneous matter now what is important here that anything which is not intended for human consumption for the intended purpose of this food item is been found in the food item would automatically come under the definition of adulterant as a common man we would think that but if we look at the legal definition the important aspect is this that something has been added something has been intentionally added by this person to increase let's say the quantity which compromises the quality of the food item so what is important that the person who has compromised with the quality of the food he is the one who has employed that adulterant to the food item now how this addition of adulterant resulting in different aspects which are the ingredients are uh, in here unsafe food substandard food misbranded food and extraneous matter now what is unsafe food something that might cause you injury 
you may suffer from food poisoning death may be caused or you may suffer from non grievous injury so we have graded penalties under section 59 for that but before we go to the penalty we will first discuss what things are been defined as unsafe food when we talk about substandard food the quality is being compromised once again when we talk about misbranded food you were making a representation which is false which is not true regarding what is written on the package or the ingredients that are been contained in that packet that will fall under the bracket of misbranded food now ultimately the extraneous matters which are not been added intentionally but which are still been found in the food item which renders the quality of the food as compromised so when we look at the penalty aspect for adulterant let's say you went to a shop where you found that the person is having adulterated pulses or wheat or rice and he is mixing the adulterant with these food items and the adulterants are kept separately the minute the enforcement agency under the fss act enters that premises and finds this adulterant they can destroy those adulterants there and then right and the penalty for it would be attracted under section 57 that one person is possessing the adulterant such as where such adulterant is not injurious to health to a penalty not exceeding 2 lakh rupees where such adulterant is injurious to health to a penalty not exceeding 10 lakh rupees so one by one we will discuss all the things that were there on the previous slide first unsafe food section 3 clause zz unsafe food means an article of food whose nature substance or quality is so affected as to render it injurious to health so what is being compromised in here the nature the substance or the quality is so compromised that it is not okay for us to consume the penalty as given under section 59 any person who whether by himself or by any other person on his behalf manufactures for sale or stores or sells or distributes or imports any article of food for human consumption which is unsafe shall be punishable where it does not cause in any injury right it was unsafe for consumption but no injury has been caused in that case the imprisonment for a term which may extend to 6 months and also with the fine which may extend to 1 lakh rupees can be imposed then where such failure or contravention results in a non grievous injury the injury here is non grievous in nature with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 1 year and also with fine which may extend to 3 lakh rupees then where such failure or contravention results in a grievous injury with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 6 years and also a fine which may extend to 5 lakh rupees where such failure or contravention results in death with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 7 years but which may extend to imprisonment for life and also with fine which shall not be less than 10 lakh rupees so as the nature of the injury is getting graver and graver what do we see the penalties also get increased so this way of framing the sentencing policy is called as graded penalties if the injury is less serious lesser penalty is to be given if the nature of injury is grave to the extent to the extent that it has caused death then the punishment can increase to even the for the imprisonment of life now it is very interesting to note that we did have two provisions under the ipc one such provision was section 273 anyone who would sell or distribute any food item which is not uh, which is adulterated and not fit for consumption that person would be penalized under the said provision 
Now, section 273 required the ingredient that this person must have intention to do so. But when we look at Food Safety and Standards Act, we did not see any such ingredient in here, which means that it is a strict liability offence. With strict liability offence, I mean to say that at the time when the court is conducting the trial under the FSS Act, the prosecution does not need to prove whether this person has intentionally rendered the food to be unsafe. So, it is not going to be tested whether you had the intention to render the food to be unsafe or not, right? You will be certainly punished. Why? Because you have caused the injury to the person who is the consuming public. Now, why we have taken such an approach? Now, the standard of duty and care that is expected from this food manufacturer in order to fix the accountability, we have made a departure from the element of proving the intention in the trial cases. Now, one such recent case is Ram Nath versus State of Uttar Pradesh, where the Supreme Court in 2024 has noted that when the person is prosecuted under IPC, right, section 273, and he's also been prosecuted under the FSS Act, can both the provisions be applied against the same person? The answer to this is no. Because after having Food Safety and Standards Act, it overrides all the provisions which are there in the IPC. So, conviction cannot take place together, both under IPC and under Food Safety and Standards Act. So, the question now here is that which act will supersede? It is the Food Safety and Standards Act that will override the any other existing provision. So, you can see Food Safety Standards Act overrides IPC. Simultaneous prosecution under both the acts are not possible. Now, what is substandard food? Section 3, Clause ZX says, an article of food shall be deemed to be substandard if it does not meet the specified standards, but not as to render the article of food unsafe. Now, when we look at, let's say, the food that we are consuming, in our mind, the impression is we are consuming the food item of the best quality. But Let's say you have purchased an apple on which the sticker was there. You went back home and you found that beneath that sticker when you take it off that it was infected with worms. So what is being served to you? You have been served with the substandard food item. Now it is very interesting that how many of us do take the action against someone who is the retailer or wholesaler dealing with such food items. The answer is that we are not as aware whether what are the laws that exist. Therefore, it is one of the more important reasons that you must know what are the provisions under the Food Safety and Standards Act. Now, the penalty for substandard food is any person who, whether by himself or by any other person on his behalf, manufactures for sale or stores or sells or distributes or imports any article of food for human consumption, which is substandard, shall be liable to a penalty which may extend to 5 lakh rupees. Now comes the misbranded food and it is very, very important. It is not section 2, it is section 3. Section 3 clause ZF. Misbranded food means an article of food. A. If it is purported or is represented to be or is being offered or promoted for sale with false, misleading or deceptive claims either upon the label of the package or through advertisement. So, if we look at the operating part of clause A, it uses the words purported or is represented to be. So, what we are looking here that the product has been represented to be where you believe that you are consuming tea of the best quality, but what happens in reality that the best quality tea has been exported and what we are consuming the residue that is left. So, if the claim on the product of the packet says best quality tea sourced from this and this place, but upon testing it was found that it is of not the promised quality, then it will be 
labeled as misbranded food now we were referring to label on the package in our example but this misbranding of food can also be done through the way of advertisement many a times we see that where the manufacturer promises that this product has nutritional value they or it does not contain let's say msg salt but in reality upon testing it was found that yes it does contain msg salt so what they have done they have made a representation through advertisement where the customers have been misled and the food is purported to be represented as something it was not how through the way of advertisement so again it is the example of misbranded food it is sold by a name which belongs to another article of food let's say it is it has been in news one person had sourced expired chocolates and now what he did that he changed the wrapper and the chocolate those were expired were been kept in the new wrappers now this person was portraying as if he was the manufacturer of the concerned chocolate in question so he was selling the food item which does not belong to him so what he is doing he is misbranding offered or promoted for sale under the name of fictitious individual or company as the manufacturer or producer of the article as borne on the package or containing the article or the label on such package again the same example can be used in this point continuing further there are three sub clauses clause a b and c now let's have a look to clause b if the article is sold in the packages which have been sealed or prepared by or at the instance of manufacturer or producer bearing his name and address but this article is an imitation of so sometimes we do see that we come across food items in the market that looks like the original food products but that is just the copy of the original food product so someone is misusing the name of the real and original manufacturer and he would be guilty for misbranding another article of food under the name of which it is sold and it is not plainly and conspicuously labeled so as to indicate its true nature so again we see the element of deception here second the package containing the article or the label on the package bears any statement design or device regarding the ingredients or the substances contained therein which is false or misleading so what we are looking here is that we are talking about package and we are talking about the ingredients that are contained in there so package tells us something else and the ingredients are something different so they are not in sync with each other right so in this case the misbranding would fall under section 3 right clause zf sub clause b and then further sub clause clause sub sub clause 2 then we look at 3 the article is offered for sale as the product of any place or country which is false so sometimes we purchase the cherries where the seller makes this promise that these have been imported from usa but in reality they have been locally sourced so what this person has done in here he has charged you higher price by serving you local strawberries so this is again misbranding if the article contained in the package contains any artificial flavoring coloring chemical preservative and that package is without a declaratory label stating that fact or is not labeled in accordance with the requirement of this act or regulations made there under or is in contravention thereof many have dietary restrictions they might be allergic to peanuts they might be allergic to some oil and this food item does contain either of the two and this person dies or he suffers any sort of injury and then he realizes that the product that he consumed did not declare such now we have a case here this person can prosecute right this manufacturer saying that that you have not declared the ingredient in the food item the label has said otherwise no declaration regarding the preservative was in there second is offered for sale for special dietary uses unless it is its label bears such information as may be specified by regulation 
concerning its vitamins, minerals, or other dietary properties in order sufficiently to inform its purchaser as to its value for such use. So again, we are looking at uh, product items which have some nutritional value. The packet says it has this much of nutrition, but the ingredients in the package says otherwise, and they are be called as misbranded food. Lastly, is not conspicuously or correctly stated on the outside thereof within the limits of variability laid down under this act. So what we have said, let's say when we talk about proprietary food, how much lead content can be found in there? So the maximum limit is 2.5 part per million. And it is not been written anywhere on the food item. So they have violated the rules. So what they have done, they have misbranded the food. Now coming to the extraneous matter and penalty, section 3 clause I. Extraneous matter means any matter contained in an article of food which may be carried from the raw materials, packaging materials or process systems used for its manufacture or which is added to it but such matter does not render such article of food unsafe. So when we talk about husk or soil has been found in the food item in its raw state, we call them as impurities. They are present but they do not render the food to be unsafe. Why? Because they can be separated from the food. Now if we talk about that the quality is so compromised that it is not safe for human consumption, then it would auto automatically become the adulterant food which is rendering the food to be unsafe for human consumption. So everything in a way is interlinked. Section 54 talks about the penalty for it. This penalty can be in the form of fine which may extend to 1 lakh rupees. Now who can be fined under this? Anyone who manufactures for sale, stores, sells, distribute or imports. All these five elements remain the same throughout the act. Now coming to the most important aspect that is contaminant given under section 3 clause G. Contaminant means any substance whether or not added to the food but which is present in such food as a result of production including operations carried out in crop husbandry, animal husbandry or veterinary medicine, manufacture, processing, preparation, treatment, packing, packaging, transport or holding of such food or as a result of environmental contamination and does not include insect fragment, rodent hairs and other extraneous matter. So when we talk about contaminants in the beginning, we said contaminants can be found in various forms. One is physical contamination, second is chemical, third is biological contamination. Now, when we talk about, let's say, the food has to be transported in a cold storage chain, right? And the temperature was not maintained. By the time food reached the destination, it has been spoiled. Why? Because the pathological or biological growth have already taken place. Now, can we say that this food item has been contaminated? The answer is yes. So, what we are looking at? Pathological contamination. This is the this is something which falls under biological contamination. Sometimes we also see metal contamination which may come into the food that we are consuming through the environment or which may be added intentionally, right? As I said, which may come from the environment or which may be added intentionally. This becomes relevant here because the operating part of the definition says whether or not added to the food. So it can come to the food, it can be introduced to the food through any way, whether done intentionally or not. Now I have given one example. Under the FASAI, FASAI comes up with the regulations that the food business operator has to comply with these standards. And one such regulation is the regulation of Food Safety Standards, Contaminants, Toxins and Residue Regulations of 2011. So we can see three columns here and the 
format remains the same throughout this regulation. So you will not find this within the Bayer Act, but these are the regulations which are notified by FASAI on their website. So we are referring to, let's say, a metal contaminant. And in this case, it is a lead. So let's say if we are talking about soft drinks, lime juice or lemon juice, the contaminant of lead in its form should not exceed 2.0 parts per million, right? And then we are looking at foods not specified. So anything for which we do not have any standards are called proprietary food. So for those food items, the maximum limit that has been provided is 2.5 part per million. Now there must be some reason for me to discuss this aspect because in the next session, we are going to talk about the Nestle Maggi case. And in that case, the Nestle Maggi, the Nestle Company Limited had contended that when we were applying for the product approval, uh, we had said that the food item contains this much of lead, whereas the notification says that it is to be allowed as long as it is not exceeding this 2.5 part per million. So what is the relevant uh, limit of the lead that has to be looked into? The one which they had applied for during the time of product approval or the one which has been notified by the FSI under the 2011 regulation. So this is how we read the regulation as notified for different food items. Now, what has been used in here? Residues. In the previous uh, slide, we had discussed that animals are being injected with growth hormones. The residue of those growth hormones are going to be found in the body of the animal. So how much residue is permitted? That it is okay if this animal has this much of the veterinary drug. That has also been specified by the FSI. Now, when we talk about toxins, we see that the crops are being sprayed with the pesticide and the, you know, insecticides. How much of it is allowed? It is okay. It is permitted. So, for that, in that context, what do we say? Maximum residue limit. These are shortly called as MRLs. Now coming to food additive, sometimes we do come across that in order to enhance the appeal of the food, in order to enhance the texture of the food, some ingredients are being used, they are being chemically washed. What happens in the process that it renders the food of substandardized quality, in some cases unsafe for human consumption. In that context, it is important for us to understand the definition of food additive. Food additive means any substance not normally consumed as a food by itself or used as a typical ingredient of the food, whether or not it has nutritive value and the intentional addition of which to food for a technological purpose in the manufacture, processing, preparation, treatment, Packing, packaging, transport or holding of such food results or may be reasonably expected to result directly or indirectly in it or its byproducts becoming a component or otherwise affecting the characteristic of such food but does not include contaminants or substances added to the food for maintaining or improving the nutritional qualities. So what is important here is that that food additive may not be consumed as a food item in itself. But sometimes we see that the vegetables have been chemically washed. They have been brushed with colors just to enhance its appearance. Sometimes the food item in order to enhance its taste, we add MSG salt. Some people might be allergic to it. So what is MSG? It is the food additive. So it is not the contaminants, right? Contaminants which could be carried on from raw material, or it may be added to the food item. Now, before we end the discussion, it is important for us to understand the organizational structure 
under the FSS Act 2006. Now the apex body, the central agency is FASAI. Now FASAI is uh, something which is being regulated under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Now it takes care of the compliance and inspection and it also lays down the standards that are to be followed by the food business operators. As I said that FASAI lays down the scientific standards. Now who develops these scientific standards? So for that we have scientific panels. We today have 21 such scientific panels under section 13. And these scientific panels, the management part of it is being regulated by the scientific committee which is constituted under section 14. On the other side, when we look at the compliance and inspection, we have one central agency that is the FASAI whose head office is located in New Delhi and it has a regional offices which we will discuss in the next session. Then at the state level also we have state food safety authority and then at the district level we have the uh, district level steering authorities. Now who are these individuals? Let's have a glance. Under section 29 state food level authority. Now this state food level authority who will control this? We have one official person that is the commissioner of the food safety who has been appointed and the functions have been enumerated under section 30. When we come to the district level we have designated officer under section 36 and then we have food safety officer like under CRPC we have police officer in the terms of constable, inspector, so on and so forth. Similarly who enforces right food safety and standards act we have food safety officer who is commonly known as food inspector now where he has been appointed and who appoints him we will see that under section 37 now someone needs to test the food and for that the labs have been created under section 43 of the food safety and standards act and who will conduct the testing we have food analysts been prescribed under section 45. So today we have tried to understand all the relevant definitions and we had a cursory glance at the organizational structure under the FSS Act. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said but also in what remains unsaid. Today I will be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered. And Indeed, the very charm of this particular story that I am going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends. It is an ancient tale from Mesopotamia which has been retold by several authors among whom the name of Somerset Mom stands out. Uh, the adaptation that I will be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that Mom wrote. The story is titled in all of its adaptations almost as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants 
to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty-handed. Indeed, the servant had all gone white, and trembling with fear, he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace. When I entered the market, the servant said to his master, I was jostled by a woman, and when I turned to look at her, I saw that she was death. I am very scared, master, because death looked at me with a threatening gesture. Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death? 